Well, our, our last speaker before we open it up for discussion and, and questions is someone who really should need no introduction to this audience, uh, former Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. King County Executive, uh, uh, Ron Sims, uh, who did an outstanding job in that. And if you, it, 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 I think Ron is one of the, his story in terms of how many things he had led on is really quite remarkable. If you look at models for healthcare, before all the pure about healthcare and everybody searching for models, Ron came back to DC and he said, here is what we are doing in King County to promote the health of our employees and residents of King County. Here is how it is saving our people money, our taxpayers, the citizens, and the workers themselves. That was healthcare. The same is true on environmental issues. And then quite wisely, President Barack Obama uh, uh, appointed Ron to be the uh, Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And I had the opportunity in one flight, uh, one of my many flights, to meet, uh, to sit next to Ron. You know, it was one of those classic stories. One day, Ron is flying to a disaster area that's been wiped out by a hurricane. The next day, he's in an inner city trying to focus on uh, rebuilding efforts of an urban core that had been decimated by the economic destruction. The very next day, he's out in some rural part of the country trying to help people who've been hit by tornadoes. It was on and on and on for nonstop. But not only was he responding in that way, he was improving substantially the model of the efficiency of the organization itself. We, we hear all about how government's inefficient, how it takes a lot of time to do things, etc. In a very brief time, with his skills and his can-do attitude and incredibly hard work, Ron managed to turn so much of that around in an agency that is, quite frankly, often known for bureaucratic delays. And it is one of the untold stories, his success. I'll interject here. Uh, Gary Locke, by the way, as Secretary of Commerce, did a very, very similar uh, thing in his role as Secretary of Commerce. So it is such a delight to see my friend and to hear from our uh, former King County Executive again about his insights and how the government can play a role in this. Ron, thank you for being here. here and it's great to be back. It is really wonderful to be back. <laughs> the, uh, and I want to uh, applaud uh, Carson Baird for all of his work in, in, a, in a very challenging, difficult district intellectually because the problems they faced and I mean you had it all in your in your lap and you handled it marvelously, marvelously well. So you deserve your own applause. <laughs> and I'm very lucky to have two members of Congress represent me. The, uh, and I don't care where you go in the state of Washington, everybody always talks about Congressman Dix being their other congressman. <laughs> and the reason why is, you know, in elected office, a lot of us know a little bit about a lot there's some people you run into who know a lot about a lot. And they are so respected by their peers and their colleagues that they have the ability to move very complicated, seemingly impossible things forward in the budget. So I want to thank Congressman Nix for your years of service, for the fact that you honored the state with your service. You're an icon and you know it, and you can walk very humbly with it. And your commitment to the environment, your commitment to housing, your commitment to social justice issues, your commitment to the fundamental integrity and operations of government are just simply exquisite. And I want to thank you for being so marvelous, so wonderful, the dean of this delegation. You are just fabulous. <laughs> is to write down a series of questions, except this time I had to answer my own questions, and, and then I decided that I would talk to my wife about the issues of acidification, and, and uh, it was really interesting because my wife's a wonderful barometer, a wonderful feedback. One is she's way smarter than I am, and I've known that, and she, she's got more degrees. She speaks four languages, and she said in her school system, if you only spoke one language, the both didn't burn too brightly to how she has treated her mom and her husband. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 
but it, you know, it's really interesting because I was trying to explain her, her, a conversation I had with the governor and a point of kind of being perplexed at the moment. And I said, you know, when I, the governor called me on the phone and said that one of the things that she wanted to leave as a legacy was the recovery of Puget Sound. And a number of us had worked for a very long period of time. Our conviction on the committee, Dr. Bear was very supportive. I was on the committee, the driver on the committee. And we basically made a decision that this region was defined by its water sources and nothing so grand and so great as the Puget Sound. And what would it mean if all of a sudden we were to lose the Puget Sound? So the governor's on the phone saying to me, welcome back. I thought, is there anything that I might interest you in? So I said, well, you wouldn't call unless you had a <laughs> She said, well, I would like for you to be uh, back on the leadership council on the, uh, the uh, Puget Sound Partnership. And I said, I would love to do that. I said, it's unfinished business with you. I would love to do this. I have a, I have a granddaughter, she's perfect. Uh, and I would love to see her one day out of those waters and seeing the orchids. I want her to stand at the windows at the locks and see salmon. I want her to enjoy the exquisite taste of fresh crabs and shellfish. And, and that is a, if I can ever endeavor and work hard enough to see the sound turned around, she will enjoy those things. So I tell the governor, yes. But I said, you know, governor, can I be really blunt? If all things remain constant, we're going to lose the sound. I said, you know, we're not organized to save it yet. And I said, and, and it's no fault of anybody, but it would, you know, be really nice if we just began to organize ourselves in a fashion to work with precision and speed and take risks. And I want to talk about that for just a little bit. The, uh, I love scientists. And, I, and I'm in a room full of people who've got brains to burn. <laughs> I don't have a brain. So you, I really love <laughs> people who are just incredibly well trained and educated and thoughtful, can handle complex words and ideas and theories. And I remember when I was a King County executive, we had a lot of scientists. And we had, I got to referee many a debate, you know, over whether or not we would save a wetland, enhance a wetland, replace a wetland. What was a wetland function? <laughs> and trying to get, you know, our, the, we had, you know, the, the, our scientists, we had a number of science disciplines, you know, whether it was, the, you know, birds, whether it was insects, whether it was reptiles, whether it was plants, all of the people trying to integrate all of that into our wetlands decisions. And, and people would stand very, very concretely or in concrete on their discipline. And I would say, that doesn't do me any good. I, all I want to do is what's right. Just what's right. So can somebody tell me what's right? And I also ran into this when we once made a decision that we could predict your health outcomes by the transportation systems you used. And we had wonderful transportation planners and land use planners and health planners. And I finally had to go in after nine months and say, time out, time out, you know. Treaty time. Can we just kind of work on common language? Because all I hear is you guys are fighting all the time, well trained in your disciplines, but there is no common language or approach. And we finally got there, and we were the first to come out with the LUTAC study. So when I looked at the sound, I was telling David Dix this, and I had to. I said, David, all I want to know is what's the best science. Because the best science will reorganize all of our approach. What's the best science? I said, there are so many things in the sound that are challenging today. We got orca pod, we got orca whales that are on the native species list. We have three listings of salmon that are on the endangered species list. We are a beautiful Puget Sound with an area that is literally dying or dead. We have some scientists who said we're already in the abyss and we're not going to get out of it. Others of us say we're rapidly getting to the abyss. We have all, the, the bulk of the state's population is a 
it within you know, 30 miles of the sound and having significant impacts on us. So what do I need as being on the Puget Sound Partnership? I said to the governor, I wanted to break a lot of pots. And she said, can we break dishes? I said, I want to break dishes and I want to break pots. <laughs> the issue is that if we continue to study the problem of the sound, we will study it why it dies. If we continue not to talk and work in a cohesive fashion, we will continue to remain in our disciplines and we will lose the sound. Acidification has to be integral to our decisions. But the issue is, what does that mean? And what does that mean? Everybody else has been making demands over what our rank order should be. I think acidification is absolutely key. It is a sign of so many other things that have gone wrong. But the issue is, how can we at least organize the sound on science? That's all I want. 